So even though this is very complicated, it's a complicated history that was shared by humans and elephants and hyenas and presumably all the plants they were eating and lions and tigers and everything else. So this is just a little exemplar for a larger system. And it turns out that what the, the, the summary of that picture is the following. What you have is out of Africa into Asia, isolation in Asia, out of Asia into Africa, isolation in Africa, out of Africa back into Asia, back and forth and back and forth. That explains, for one thing, that explains why the steppe habitats of Central and Eastern Europe and, and Western Asia, of Eurasia, that's why the greatest diversity and abundance of elephant fossils are there. Because that was the highway. They went back and forth, and that was, that was the area that experienced the largest number of movements. West to east, east to west, west to east, east to west. So if somebody says, so what do you believe about human evolution? Out of Africa or out of Asia? And you say, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. And it turns out that this is, this is a, a, a very old, this is a 12 or 15 million year pat, old pattern. But it turns out for the last 15,000 years, human beings have been doing the same thing. Every time the climate has changed in the last 12 to 15,000 years, human beings responded to climate change by moving away if they could, coping with the change situations if they could, and dying if they could. And that's kind of the story of, of evolution. So it turns out that, that what we would expect to find is clusters of host range expansions that are correlated with climate change events. And that's exactly what we find in all of these, all of these studies that have been done so far. So the Stockholm paradigm is a dynamic hypothesis about the interplay between capacity and opportunity in which changes in opportunity, ecological opportunity drive the system and allow the subsequent evolution of new capacities. This is one of the reasons that disease emergence can be so rapid. We don't have to wait for some new mutation that allows the pathogen to jump into a new host before it happens. And that's why you can have these really rapid breakouts of disease once a new host has been colonized, has been added to the repertoire, the pathogen is then more generalized in its fitness space and that allows a greater possibility for those kinds of strange new mutations to show up. This is one of the reasons that we understand that the geographic distribution of disease is always less than the geographic distribution of the pathogen. And we also know that the outbreak of disease, especially highly pathogenic versions of the disease, are almost always associated with the margins of the geographic distribution of the pathogen. Because that's where they're expanding into new fitness space and coming into contact with susceptible hosts that have never seen them before and therefore have no resistance. So evolutionary biology Basic evolutionary biology is, is important in trying to cope with the crisis of emerging diseases. As host range expansions are going to occur, that is, generalizing by highly specialized pathogens will occur wherever and whenever geographic distributions and or trophic connections are altered. And the drivers are climate change and secondarily now, human population, especially population density, and globalization. I mean, one, of the, one of the worst things that humanity ever did to itself with respect to disease was to urbanize. In 1918, 100 years ago, this coming November, the, the so-called Spanish influenza pandemic infected 25% of the human beings on this planet. And it 
killed 10% of all of the humans on this planet. Influenza is a, uh, a pathogen that is transmitted directly, and so the probability of transmission is directly proportional to population density. We currently have 4.5 times more human beings on this planet than in 1918, and 4.6 times as many people living in cities as in 1918. And we have not been able to reconstruct the, the variant of influenza that caused that pandemic. So it's not one of the variants that's included in any of the annual vaccines. We don't know what happened. We literally don't know at a molecular level what that was. But we do know, we know, that the ecological conditions, the opportunity for a much more devastating influenza pandemic exist. And we've created those conditions for ourselves. And we've made them worse by everything that our cities have done, like heavy industry, that has altered the trajectory for climate change. So it's like I said, it's nobody's fault, but everybody's too late. I mean, nobody, nobody intended to do this. Everybody thought they were doing something good. And we, we, we really hurt ourselves. The pathogenicity is not caused by genetic changes caused by climate change, that's because it's just a matter of susceptible hosts with no resistance. Um, uh, well, I'm not, let me not worry about that, we've already talked about this. Um, we have to assume that there are many, many, many potential disease outbreaks waiting to happen. And remember, we're talking about not just diseases in humans, we're talking about livestock, we're talking about crops, some of you may know that there's a rust fungus uh, that's broken out in the Middle East that is moving north and west that does not respond to any known fungicide. Agricultural economists in, in Europe are now talking about the economic and nutritional impact of the extinction of wheat within 20 years. As 27% of the calories that human beings eat every day on this planet is wheat. Wheat, rice, and corn, three species of plants, 67% of all of the calories that human beings eat every day. We've done this to ourselves. I mean, wheat, corn, and rice, we focus on them because we can get big yields out of them. But part of the cost of growing big yield crops is that they're highly susceptible to disease. So this is how we create this minefield of, of potential disease outbreaks. They can happen rapidly, they can happen quickly. We have to assume today that what we are seeing today is only the beginning of the really bad emerging disease crisis. What we're seeing today is nothing compared to what 30 years will look, from now will look like. And we have no reason to believe that the host range expansions will stop until climate change fluctuations stop and we don't know when that's going to be. Climate change fluctuations are not going to stop for the foreseeable future. That is, not for the next 100 or 200 years. So this is essentially a permanent condition, especially if you have children or grandchildren. It also turns out that what we're seeing with the Stockholm paradigm and pathogens and hosts is not restricted to pathogens and hosts. In fact, it seems that this is exactly what has happened to all of life on this planet evolutionarily every time there have been major climate change events. And this is, this is a passage from one of, of Alicia Stegall's work dealing with periods 500, 600 million years ago. And the pattern is the same. The environment changes as a result of climate change. Species try to move away from the environment that's changing in ways that they're not adapted to. If they can move away and find good environment, they will survive. If they don't, they will die. The vast majority of extinctions are the failure to escape. Now, if, you, if you're 
you're not able to expand into new fitness area and survive long enough to come up with a solution to the climate change, you'll die. And that's why we have uh, episodes of 50 or 60 percent of the world's biodiversity going extinct during major climate change events. Because as Darwin pointed out, you can't always get, oh no, that's right, there was the Rolling Stones that said, you can't always get what you want. But Darwin said it first. It basically, Darwin said, you know, just because the environment changes doesn't mean you magically get to adapt to it. Usually, you don't. So, this thinking, this, this paradigm, this Stockholm business, can be applied to a lot of different things because post-range expansion, geographic expansion, it's the same phenomenon we talk about when we talk about invasive species and introduced species. So why sometimes introduced species do really well? It's the same thing we talk about when we try to understand why biological control programs so often fail. But the good news is that ecological fitting also explains why we don't necessarily expect entire ecosystems to completely collapse when key species go extinct. So this idea of a, a trophic cascade, you knock out a few keystone species and everything collapses, that's, that will happen if there's no such thing as ecological fitting. If there is ecological fitting, then when this species goes extinct, we suddenly discover that this species here would have done this if this species had never been there. So this species goes extinct, this species just moves over and goes, ah, I'm glad that guy's gone. And it turns out then that maybe we don't have such catastrophic ecosystem collapses as we we're worried about. So the news is not all bad. It's mostly bad, but it's not all bad. We have to understand that the period of time that we're living through now is one of these evolutionary episodes, and it really doesn't matter who caused it or what caused it. We are in a period of time, one of those evolutionary episodes in which the old is passing away, and it's setting the stage for the new to emerge. And the emerging disease crisis tells us that the biosphere is beginning to cope with climate change the way it always has. But we have to understand that biological evolution does not care about any particular species, no matter how self-important it is. The reality is we get to choose whether we're going to go extinct or not. The biosphere is simply going to cope with climate change, and we can decide whether we want to be part of that or whether we just want to pretend that there's no problem and then we die and it's not a problem because I'll be dead before my grandchildren have any problems so who cares, right? Well it turns out that there are, th there are things we can do if we decide to do it. Okay, So we have to start with this notion that we need to do something that human beings are capable of doing but never do very well which is we're always capable of anticipating the future but rarely do we do anything about that. Okay, I can anticipate that because of my ancestry and because I'm fat, that I'm at risk for a heart attack. Am I losing weight? Uh, right? So, all human beings are not particularly good about acting on the future. But we're in a situation now where if we as a species don't, anticipate, don't act on what we're anticipating, the results could be devastating. The time is short, the danger is great, and we are largely unprepared. By 2050, the World Economic Forum estimates that 100% of all agricultural soils on this planet will be completely depleted. We will be growing food hydroponically by 2050. The Melbourne Sustainable Studies Institute estimates that by 2050, a combination of conflict, migration, disease, starvation, flood, and drought will have eliminated the human overpopulation problem because half 
of the human population of today will be gone. That we will be from 7.5 million down to less than 4 million, 4 billion people by 2050. But bear in mind that because more than 50% of human beings live in cities now, and that's where all of our technology is centered, if we lose 50% of humanity abruptly in the next 30 years, we're going to lose substantial amounts of our technological infrastructure. So they anticipate that by 2050, living conditions on this planet will resemble the beginning of the 20th century. This, this is not good. I mean, this is really not good. And I don't know about you, but I have children and stepchildren and grandchildren, and all of them, like I have three, I have three wonderful Hungarian stepsons. And if I drop them in the middle of Beijing tomorrow with their cell phones, they could survive just fine. But if I take them out into the forest in the northern part of Hungary without their cell phones and say survive, they're dead. Because one of the things we've done by making ourselves urbanized and urbanized species is that we have created two, at least two generations of people now who find it almost impossible to live outside of a highly technological niche. When Hurricane Katrina ruined the city of New Orleans 10 years ago, within 72 hours of losing electricity and transport into the city, People were killing each other for food. And these are, these are some realities that, that we have to face, and we can change that. With respect to emerging diseases, we have to be proactive. We have to stop waiting until the next big outbreak happens, and then heroically respond to it. Because, let's face it, my doctor is right. If I lose weight, and do not have a heart attack, that's going to be better for me, and it's going to be cheaper for the healthcare system than if I stay fat, I have a heart attack, and they have to save me with coronary bypass surgery. And then I have to change my diet anyway. So I might as well do it now, right? And save some money. Most of the money, that trillion dollars a year that's being spent on emerging diseases, is not spent on huge global pandemics like the ones that Bill Gates is, is warning about now. All of those are what we call death by a thousand cuts. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. They completely preoccupies all of the existing resources of agricultural and public health systems worldwide, which means that when a big pandemic happens, there aren't any resources left to deal with them. And we're not planning for this. We're not anticipating it. The world's public health and veterinary and agricultural health people act like the next report of an emerging disease is the last one that will ever happen. And it's partly because they've been trained in a paradigm of coevolution that is manifestly not true. What we need to do now and, and it's with emerging diseases, you could put in food, water, uh, warming, sea level rises, any of the threat multipliers for climate change in there. What we need now is policies that, that anticipate the future. We have to anticipate that things are going to get worse for us. We have to accept that, and then we have to adapt to what's coming. We can no longer afford to pretend that either nothing's happening or once it happens, we can fix it. Because the only way we can fix what's coming at us is to adapt to it. We will not magically come up with the right adaptation when the Greenland ice sheet falls into the Atlantic Ocean. New York City will have three hours to evacuate. They are not going to magically come up with a solution at that point to save themselves. They will die. We are already moving into a world where there are two kinds of places for human beings. The places that people are running away from and places that are people are running to. And both of those situations have severe consequences 
for our future as a technological species. We need to try to buy time. We need to try to adapt to what's coming and to accept what's coming. With respect to emerging diseases, we need to do what we call finding them before they find us. We need to know what's coming. If there's malaria in southern Switzerland, there is nothing to keep that malaria from coming through on a straight line through southern Austria right to Lake Balaton in Hungary within three years. So, what do you do about it? What do you do? Well, it turns out that the answer is both simple and really complicated. Because we have, a, we have a protocol. We know what to do. We know how to get people out there. Citizen scientists working with, you know, with highly technological people and you know, all this, this good technology and stuff. We know how to get out there and find this stuff and track it as it's coming towards us. We know how to teach people how to mitigate the possibility of, of getting malaria by doing things like looking for mosquito larvae in the bird bath in your garden and dumping them out. We know how to do that. There are a lot of things we could do. The problem is this requires a degree of cooperation among human beings that humanity has never done. In particular, doing something to protect your country from emerging diseases requires that you help the countries that are the sources of those diseases coming at you, even if you don't like them. So, for example, you know, Hungarians, well, Hungarians sort of don't like anybody, but they mostly don't like people coming from parts of the world that used to occupy them. What a surprise, right? You used, you, know, you used to occupy our country, we don't like you anymore. Well, this is not unreasonable, right? But it also is something that we cannot afford as a species. This is going to be very difficult. And, and I would say that, that most, most scientists would never say this in public. But when they're talking among scientists, they will say, we don't think that's going to happen. And this is, this is the, what we call the Cassandra Collective. And so the, the myth of Cassandra. Cassandra was um, the sister of Paris who stole Helen of Troy and started the whole thing up. Well, when Cassandra was a priestess of Athena, Apollo tried to seduce her and she wouldn't let him. And so he cursed her. He said, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to make, I'm going to 